the cost of control is connection. And what children are always seeking is connection. Now, a lot of people say, say they want my attention. They're just very attention seeking. To gain someone's attention is a skill that you use to connect. They're gaining your attention so you can make a connection so that you can then help them either make sense of their world or soothe what's going on. In this upcoming episode, you get an inside look into an incredible, incredible person, Ginny Luther. Ginny is a master instructor in conscious discipline. She is someone who's taught me so much about connecting more deeply with myself in order to connect more deeply with my children, which has completely shifted our dynamic in such a beautiful and easy way. In this episode, I wanted you to really get to know Ginny and to understand how powerful these tools are by having her walk you through every mom's worst nightmare that she experienced with her child. Also, we talk about her book, Blue Star Grit, which is hands down one of the best books I have ever read. It's available in paperback and audio. I highly recommend you grab it. Enjoy this episode. You're going to love her as much as I do. All right. Welcome, Ginny Luther. This is the second time I've had you on. And now that I have read your incredible, incredible book, um, I'm so excited to spend this time with you and have my listeners get to know the Ginny that we all know and love. So thank you for being here again. Thank you for having me. I feel honored. Okay. So Ginny's book, which you can see behind her, Blue Star Grit, this is, I recommend this book for everyone. I've already given two away to friends. I recently spent the day in the Miami DMV. I lined up there for a walk-in appointment at 6.30 a.m. And their computers kept going down and breaking. And I was like, you know what? I'm just here and I'm just getting this done. I never want to come back again. I read your book from cover to cover. And all these people in the DMV were going crazy. Like, you know, it literally was seven hours, eight hours. We were there for 10 hours. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm I'm kind of liking this. Like, I have this excuse to just read this book. All these people were gathered around me like, what are you reading? You haven't put that down. You're crying. You're laughing. You're such a writer. You have such a beautiful style about you and your vulnerability. And I can't even imagine, you know, the process of writing a book like this and what you had to go through. And we're going to talk a little bit about that process and about what this is. Um, but thank you. You know, something that I love about you is you're so relatable. You're so humble. You are clearly here to help other people show up as the best version of themselves. And the challenge, the challenges that you've gone through are something that is every mom's worst fear. And the way you've come out on the other side is just so, so beautiful. So thank you. Oh, thank you. It really was a love of labor, let me tell you. And Bart helped me to really write the book because it was during COVID. So I would imagine he was there with you. Well, let's jump right in. I want to talk about your two boys and the beginnings of their lives and how different the two of them were, because I think a lot of us moms that have multiple children can relate to the personality differences in our own home. Yeah, well, Nicholas was first born and he was that flexible kid. You know, he was the kid I planned, wanted all my life, actually made me into a mother. And uh, the feeling of his birth was just euphoric. And it was a love that I've never felt before in my life. And I was the happiest, happiest mom in the world. I couldn't wait to be a mom. I knew I was going to be a mom at one point. I knew when I was 11, I was going to work with kids. I just knew I was going to be. And there was this kid and he was so flexible. You know, he was easy to put down and he would play with Legos or he was easy to ride in the car. He had some difficulty sleeping, but you know, you put him in the car like everybody else does it. 11 o'clock at night until they fall asleep and then you put them back in. He was so flexible. And if I changed plans, it was not a problem. He could be in anybody's arms and be a happy little guy. He didn't have problems separating from me when I drop him off at the sitters. All was well. Bart, on the other hand, was not a planned pregnancy. I was very stressed out. I was in the middle of divorcing or separating from my first husband. And so, you know, my state during pregnancy was very stressed, not knowing at the time any of the effects of that on a pregnancy, but I was very, very stressed. It was not a planned pregnancy at all. I was, I, and I couldn't, my husband didn't even believe that he was the father. That's how much we were ready to be separated. And so he couldn't even believe he was the father. And that's a whole nother topic. But bottom line is he came out with guns in his hand and ready to take on the world. <laughs> so, so he was not flexible at all. 
if he didn't get his way, starting at like 18 months to two years, he would not just throw himself on the floor. I was talking to some people, a family today. They, he throws himself on the floor and for 20 minutes, he screams and cries. I said, well, try putting that with someone who destroys your entire house. You know, that's who Bart was. Bart would get up and just destroy everything. And I was mortified because, you know, I was in the professional business and working in a psychiatric center. And I thought, I'm the one who should know better. I wasn't showing that I was knowing better. I was trying to control him. I was screaming at him. I was restraining him. I was bribing him. I was trying to reward him. I was punished. I tried everything and nothing worked. So they were really polar opposites. Wanting actually the same thing. They just went about different ways of doing that. That's an interesting way to look at it. I love that. There's a part in the story where you talk about, you know, I don't know how old he was. He was obviously very young, but he was in a walker and you had left the room for a second and he pulled down the entire Christmas tree. And instead of being scared for what he did, which would be a very normal response for a baby that age, he had no qualms about him. And that's when you knew you had said like you were kind of in trouble. The regular things just weren't going to work with this kid. No, if you could see the delight in his eyes, you know, he had stretched the Christmas tree lights, which pulled the tree from a, you know, an upright to a 45 degree angle. And all I could see was the end of the, I couldn't see him at the end of the lights. I just had to follow this trail of lights through two rooms. And there he was and the delight on his face There was no amount of reprimand that was going to affect him one bit. He just saw, he saw the power, his personal power. He Mm -hmm. grabbed onto it and said, this, this is what I want. Yeah. So there was a little bit of an uh uh-oh in there. I tried to push it off and say, oh, someday we'll laugh about this. But inside me, (laughs) there was a red flag sign going off. That's when he was like seven months. Yeah. You, you talk about in the book how, you know, precocious he was and just ahead of his time, clearly a born leader, someone who's here to make a pretty big ripple while they're here. And, you know, the stories that you lay out in the book about, you know, the events at grocery stores and things that so many of us moms can relate to our kids having a meltdown and you're just in the absolute wrong place at the wrong time. And you feel everybody staring at you and how uncomfortable that is. And then what we all have done where we future trip and we think about, oh my God, who is our kid going to turn into? Like, if I can't do this, what is this kid going to become? Tell me, you know, more about some of those experiences that you had with him. Well, I think the classic one, there was most, all the stories kind of (laughs) exacerbate me as a parent. And as he gets older and I do some of my own personal work, I get better at responding. But initially I was more reactive than I was responsive and exacerbated. I was exhausted by by more my inability to control myself than what he was doing. At the time, I thought it was what he was doing. So there's this the classic story in the book, and I almost named the book this, The Wooden Spoon, is when I'm a single parent, because I separated when Bart was like five months old. And was then a single parent, realizing that it was going to be a lot harder than I thought it was. And uh, because there was no one there to tag team, you know, I couldn't just say, you take them for a second or you decide something. I had to decide everything coming off of a very, working with pre-K, very extraordinary uh, uh, pre-K children who were exposed to severe physical and emotional abuse. So I was all day with those children and come home to my preschooler. So it was, it was really hard. And, and Bart just tested. I mean, I remember, I don't know if you remember when they're like really young and they're so into everything. You have to put everything but the lamps on top of everything. You can't put anything down because they're going to take it and throw it or play with it or do something dangerous. They didn't have those things for the plugs. You know, they didn't have those mm. safety mm-hmm. mechanisms back in the day. But so you had to watch them constantly. But I'll, he gets he gets on the couch and he starts flipping the lights back and forth, 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 because I can't take the lamps off the table. It's the only light in my house. And I'm in the kitchen trying to get dinner together after a long day. And I go in there and he always and I learned later that kids show their fear by making it into a game. So they smile sometimes when they're feeling fear. And I didn't perceive it as a smile. I thought he was doing this to me, you know? And I was like, can't you see? I've had a long day. I am trying to be your mother and you are not cooperating and you're just driving me to the last 
ends of the earth. So he's back and forth, mm-hmm. back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I just lost it. I, I lost it in my mind. So I'm looking at him and I, I stomp into the t- kitchen and I pull out a wooden spoon, which of course is what my parents did to me or my brothers with the threat, you know. And I watched myself act stupid. I was literally watching myself knowing I was going to, I was either going to hurt him really badly or I was going to have to eat crow with him because I was not going to follow through. But I got really close to his face with my wicked witch of the West, you know, look on my face and said, if you do that again, I'm going to pull your pants down and I'm spank your bottom with this spoon. And he turned around to me with that big shit eating grin with no, no other words to say it pulls his pants down, puts Mm -hmm. his hiney in my face and says, come on, spank me, spank me, mommy, spank me. (laughs) At that moment, I knew I was doing the wrong thing in the first place, but it was my last straw. You know, you have your last straw and it was gone. And now I'm looking at his whole life and I'm like, oh no, this is tragic. I'm not going to gain control of this child. He is going to run away with this and be a serial killer by the time he's 16. He's going to get drunk mm-hmm. and dr- I don't know what he's going to do, but I'm scared to death. I mean, it scared me in that moment. I was frightened because yeah. I had lost complete control. And I had an epiphany, you know, and I stood there with, you know, a white ashen face, not knowing how to respond to him. And I just thought there has to be something better. Like I can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and think it's, it's not, this can't just be about him. I don't know what the answer is, but it can't just be about him. And that was the day I began to open up my heart and vision to say, there's got to be something out there. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to find it. And you did. And I think, you know, again, so many of us can relate to that. Like so many of us have had those challenges where we're done, we're exhausted, like our heads are spinning. We're not in our body. We're in our head. We're dealing with our work stress, our home stress, whatever. There's so much noise. And then there's chaos over here and you just can't take it. It's like, you know, all the things that you're supposed to do or that you want to do or how you want to handle these things better. But like when you're in that triggered moment, when you're living in your amygdala, <laughs> you just snap. And that's so relatable, Jenny. And I think probably every mom has gone through it. And if you're not, I think we're not being honest with ourselves. And, you know, one of the key words I think you used there is control. Like in those moments, we try to control. And I think a lot of it is fear-based because we do worry. We worry about either one, who's watching us and judging us, or two, what is this child going to become? And so we're trying to control them. And you opened up your world and you asked for a better solution. And I believe this is, you know, when you found conscious discipline. So control, just remember always, and this is so important to remember, is that the cost of control is connection. You always lose connection. And what children are always seeking is connection. Now, a lot of people say they want my attention. They're just very attention seeking. Well, attention is actually to gain someone's attention is a skill that you use to connect. So a Mm. child is trying to get your attention so they can connect with you to either ask for something, be cuddled, be soothed. So babies cry for attention. They cry to get your attention. They're gaining your attention so you can make a connection so that you can then help them either make sense of their world or soothe what's going on. This is the cycle of self-regulation and we need this all our life. However, once children start talking, we assume they should know how to gain our attention in a way that connects us. So connection is actually what wires the brain for impulse control, motivation, and self-regulation. It's how the brain functions from a reactive state to a responsive state. You have to make a connection with somebody else, whether it's through empathy when they're crying or whether it's playful interactions that build the bonds, the connection for a child to trust you and be motivated with your guidance. So in these moments when kids are really giving us a hard time or they're screaming for our attention, if we're stressed out, we are disconnected. We're disconnected from ourselves because we're either think we're in the future. Like, what did you call it? Uh, future tripping. You were either future tripping or we're past tripping. Mm-hmm. So we're focused on not the now, 
And children read the now. That's what they're in, is in the now. So they know when you're not in the now. They're either going to turn your head or they're going to do something that really jolts you into paying attention to what they're doing. If it's negative, they don't care. They would rather have positive, but negative at least gets you there. And if we then conditionally say, because you did it in that way, I'm now going to disconnect from you, then you've lost, you you lost the game. You can't help them. So in my moment, I just said, you're going to get the wooden spoon because you're driving me crazy. I don't even want to be connected to you right now. And so then Bart just kept doing it more and more and more and more and more because it was the only thing he knew to do to gain my attention. And I was so disconnected because I was so stressed out. So it's really, it's essentially connection over control. And one of the things that I love about conscious discipline is it becomes so easy. You know, I think especially young moms, when we're starting out, it's like, you can go into Barnes and Nobles and there's 500 books on how to parent your children. And it, I found that really overwhelming because it's like these systems and these routines and these, I'm, for me, I'm not that way. I think some people need that like schedule and rigidness and all that just became so overwhelming to me. I didn't know what to do. And with conscious discipline, when you boil it down to something as simple as connection over control, we as moms don't have to think about, okay, what does that look like? And I would love for you to give the example of Bart's bedtime, because I think that's a lot of, especially young boys, that's where they really, really crave the connection. And so I think a lot of people can relate to this story and how easy you flip that switch when you switch to connection over control. Are you talking about the um, night, night, sleep tight? When he kept coming out, kept coming out. Kept right. Coming out. So <laughs> I wrote this story because I, because I think a, a lot, there's still more stories I haven't written, but I wrote this one because so many parents do actually experience this feeling. It's the end of the night. It's time to put him to bed. You know, they need a lot of sleep. You can't wait to sit down with a glass of wine, watch Survivor, just talk to nobody, be in your own space or pick up a book, but just do what you want to do for a minute and and do it before you get too tired to do it. You know, that's, I mean, that's what you want. So when you're putting your child to bed, everybody knows we do kisses and hugs and rituals and little things to help them say, I love you, mommy. I love you back. I love you this much. So we do some of those rituals because those rituals really help with with a child, with your your connection before you're separated. So physical separation is a disconnect for children. So you want to try to do some connection beforehand. But what I was doing one night, you know, Bart, because Bart it was such a control freak. One night I I had been doing this, you know, there he would say, there's monsters in my room. There, and this is when he's two. He's got the binky in his mouth. You know, imagine him having a binky all the time in his mouth. There's a monster in my room and he won't leave. So I would have to go up there, have a party with the monsters, find all the monsters. Then we'd escort him out the door. And when I was patient enough, which would, that would take me about a half hour, that would work and he'd go to bed. Okay. So then one day I just came home so exhausted. I said, enough of this. I am tired of him. And I felt like he was controlling me. So I said, tonight I'm going to put him in bed and I'm not going to, I'm not going to succumb to any of his manipulative tactics. And so I put him to bed, did my rituals, night, night, sleep tight, and put your head down, put your head down. Nick was no problem. I would do this and I didn't have any problem. Bart, not so much. So I went downstairs and of course I said to myself, let the the struggle begin because I am not, I am not going to give in. Well, that right there just tells you I'm in a power struggle. So I, I'm making sure I'm going to win. If I'm going to win, then you know, he could sniff a a struggle a mile away. So of course he, he comes out and and I, I just would walk up the stairs, pick him up quietly and gently, put him back into the, into the bed. And then I'd go back downstairs. Well, after about 10 times of this, I finally said, I'm just going to plant myself on top of the stairs, just sit my fanny down on top of the stairs. And I'm just going to pick him up and put him in, pick him up. So I don't have to go running up and down the stairs and do a workout when I really just wanted to rest. So that went on for about two hours. (laughs) You know, the more I, the more I tried to put him in calmly, the, each time it got less and less calm. Do you know what I mean? It was like, 
yeah. a little. I do know what you mean. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you get back in that yeah. bed. No, nope, now. And I'm trying to be nice. But energetically, what I was doing was disconnecting from him because I had decided he was driving me nuts. And if he was driving me nuts, then I was giving my power away to him. And he could sniff that a mile away. So I was not yeah. so aware because I think it was very, it was very subtle. I wasn't paying attention to my inner state. I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was in my mind. So I was thinking, he's not going to get away with this. He's not going to get away with this. I'd take a deep breath and I'd go, come on, honey, it's time for bed. I'm going to put you in bed. You're safe. Right. But my mind was going, mm -hmm. just go to sleep. So finally, after about mm -hmm. two and a half hours, he comes out with his binky in his mouth. He goes, will you rock me, mommy? Now that was different. He had mm -hmm. requested other things. He was coming out. He had all kinds of ideas. He's bringing his little puppets and stuffed animals out and, and saying he wants this. Or it was, he was very manipulative. So finally I said, okay, I will rock you. So I picked him up, brought him into my bed. I started rocking him and singing Hush Little Baby, which was his favorite. And in a moment, and I was so frustrated, but I, I started to rock. And of course, rocking was starting to calm me and singing the song was starting to calm me. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. as I start the song, he starts patting my back. You know, he, you know how kids will do that? Mm -hmm. So he was, yeah, trying to, hand. he was trying to pat my back. And in that moment, mm -hmm. I can't really tell you, but it was just this moment of release. I just went, oh, this is about me. This isn't about him. He's saying to me, mommy, it's going to be all right. I just need a little connection, true connection. Mm -hmm. And when I did and that. And then he went to bed? He to went bed? right to bed. Mm -hmm. And oh, it was such a learning you. thing for me. And I'm thinking, you know, that was when I, I, I didn't really have total concept, but we really grew each other up. He was always challenging me to see myself, always. I feel like that, at least from what you've taught me, you know, through the Center Academy community is that's conscious discipline. It's about, you know, connection over control. It's about changing our state or disciplining ourselves before disciplining our children, connecting with ourselves before connecting with our children and love and acceptance. And I know that that's something that you really latched onto later on. And I want to kind of pivot the conversation here a little bit. And I know I asked your permission to talk about some of these topics because I know they're not comfortable, but I appreciate you sharing. Um, so I was in a parent coffee where we get to ask you these questions and you had described Bart. And I'm sure like a lot of my listeners here, if they have a child that's has similar patterns, you know, a mom raised her hand and she said, gosh, I have one of those kids. You know, I can tell you're telling stories from 20 years ago, perhaps. So how is Bart now? When she said, how is Bart now? Well, I, I told her that he was murdered. And what I said was, it was one of those things that was out of my control. He had gone to Iraq and done the service. I had given in to his, I'd given in. I accepted his journey that he chose early on. And then only to come back and get killed by one of his own soldiers. And that always, always touches people when I talk about it. And of course, I've done enough healing through my grief and all of that to say, it's not that I don't feel anymore, but I've got come to a place of acceptance with it. But the biggest thing about it was that I was expecting him to die in Iraq. I was not expecting him to be killed by a soldier in his backyard. But what I recognized was the soldier who killed him was exactly the child I feared or the adult that I feared Bart would become. And so because of that, I didn't have to forgive him. I immediately empathized with him. I was angry that it happened. I was angry that he chose my son, but I was not angry at him. It's a really hard concept. In fact, the, for the reporter that came to my house right away says, are you going to forgive the killer? And I said, I don't have to forgive the killer. He could not understand what I was saying. He kept that. What do you mean you can't forgive? What do you mean? Like, that doesn't make any sense. I told him, I can be still feel mad. It's not that I don't feel angry or sad or any of those things. But if I blame him, 
then I have to forgive him. And I blame him for making the choice he made, but I don't blame him. He was a product of his own childhood, which was very chaotic, so much abandonment as a child. He lived most of his life in foster care. I was more angry at the army than, quite frankly, than I was at Jody. It was really interesting. A lot of people didn't understand that. There's a couple chapters in there about that. Yep. There's a part in your book where your husband, you know, I think you were going through one of your, you were, you were grieving and you were angry and you were letting it out as, as we should. And he asked you, who are you angry at? Who are you angry with? And it's almost like he knew, he knew what the answer was going to be. And he went on, you know, you listed everybody, the army, you know, people in your past, your childhood, all these things. And he said, but you're not mad at Jody. Jody is the one who murdered Bart. And, you know, I found that to be such a beautiful, interesting take. And it was like you, like you describe in the book, it wasn't even something that you caught and worked on. You, it's like, it seemed like you realized it in that moment that Jody was what you feared Bart could become, but because you chose to love and accept him. And I want to talk about that a little bit because you talk a lot in your book about it's intentions and labels that we use with our children that can shape them into feeling loved and supported, which can completely change the trajectory of their lives. And again, this becomes really easy when we tap into connection. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So Jody did not get the support. He didn't. And and the, the key really you're talking about is empathy, which is to be able to see from their point of view. If you have empathy, then you don't really need to forgive because you see from their point of view. And so that there's that piece, but labels are definitely something that, uh, that affect children, whether they're good labels or bad labels. It does, it does have a huge impact on how they perceive themselves because how we see them is how they see them. And empathy requires you seeing the best in them. That's positive intention to your intention for them and empathy, how you see them and how you help them to see themselves either in judgment, which is going to create a path of not enoughness and them trying to seek something outside of themselves to prove themselves to be enough or from acceptance of where they are, which allows them to take their personal power and move forward and take total responsibility for every feeling and choice they make. That's really big because our society really does judge. So for instance, you know, for me, and this is still my tape, I, I still recognize that I had two labels that I remember. One was that I was cute. Okay. So to this day, you know, I, I can look in the mirror and say, I think you're cute. I wouldn't say pretty. Pretty isn't something that really resonates with me, but cute resonates with me because probably I was told that all the time. Okay. Also, what resonates with is with is the word stupid. And stupid is what I got a lot of and listened to when I was young. It was either from my brothers or my father. How could you be so stupid? How could you be so stupid if I asked a question or something? And I struggled in school. So stupid was this demon that was inside of me. And I fought, which is why it took me a long time to write this book. Because I really felt mm. too stupid to write. I'm not a writer. I struggled in school. I'm too stupid to do this. Right? That, mm. that was what I had to overcome. But that does not, in that moment. But that does not mean, <laughs> I still will say, I'm not a writer. I will still say that because I'm a little too stupid to be a writer. Do you know what I mean? Oh my God, you're such a writer. That it, and, and thank you for sharing that because I, you know, one of the messages, one of the big messages I want people to take home from everything that I do is there's this desire in us to do things, whether it's write, sing, play an instrument. And we all have those voices that are like, you can't because who cares? Like, who cares? What are we here for if not to do that? You have written such a beautiful book. You're such a writer, Jenny. And they're all lies. We know they're not true. Oh, yes. No, I know. I know they're not. It's just to be conscious because in that moment, you can accept that to be helpful or hurtful to yourself. And when you have that pause to accept it as that's not helpful. I know that's part of your little girl that your belief system that's false. That's not helpful. Even if you believe it for a moment, it's still not helpful to you. So shift it. And I can when usually... 
in the middle of the night when it's quiet, but it's hard when you're like multitasking and doing a ton of different things. And then you make a mistake and you find yourself, I find myself saying, oh, that was so stupid, Ginny. Right. When we're multitasking, we go unconscious, right? We play out the patterns. We're not conscious of what's happening. So when these voices come in, it's, it becomes harder to separate them from us. We're not in our aware state. We're in our, it's like scripting. And multitasking, unfortunately, between the distraction of social media in our phones and this badge of honor of being able to do three things at once and still function, I think it's a huge detriment to our children's upbringing. Huge. I don't know what's going to happen. Now, I'm 68 years old, so maybe I'm just an old person coming from a perspective of where is this world going to? But I've really seen attention span um, really, really drop. Like with the adult world, believe it or not, I used to hold classes and I would do classes once a week, three hours at a time. And parents would come, a lot of parents would come. This was before, you know, Mm -hmm. social media, cell phones and all of that. And now I can can barely get parents to come for an hour and a half. I think, you know, I, I'm so thankful that I do, I do see that as well. And we can't multitask. Like we, we could say that we're doing it, but we're not, we're, something is falling short. Right. But, um, I do have hope. I think that, you know, with something like conscious discipline and people like you doing what you're doing and helping us understand how important this is and how impactful this is. And for me, how easy it is like that, that I think is what I really want people to hear. Like when you were sitting on the top of the steps and Bart was coming out of his bed, like I have dealt with that with probably every single one of our children. And for me in those moments, like when I lose myself, I would go to, okay, what am I supposed to do? Like, do I go in there and hug them and love them? Or is that going to teach them to do this and take advantage of me? Am I messing them up by not giving them love? Like, tell me where to turn. Give me the book to follow. But with conscious discipline, it's just connection, period. And like, as moms, we just know how to connect with our children. Right. You got to connect with your own self. So if you're distracted, you're disconnected from your own self and you can't be connected with children. So the idea is to pause. This is where the self-regulation, reboot, reboot. I have the three R's, reboot. Take some deep breaths. Just slowly take some deep breaths and reflect with, I'm safe. I got this. It's going to get handled. The answer's going to come to me. Keep breathing and then redirect your attention to what you want. So redirect, so reboot, reflect, redirect. And when you do that, then you can be more present. That's going to keep you present. Sometimes I use this little trick too, is I, I just start noticing everything around me. So when I'm breathing, I'm just, I can open up my eyes or close my eyes, but I go, okay, there's the fronds outside blowing with the breeze and it's sky's blue and there's a few clouds. And, you know, I'm just noticing in the present, not judgment. I could be saying, oh, that pillow's sitting wrong on the couch. I need to fix it. No, (laughs) the pillow's on the couch. It's exactly where it should be (laughs) in this Mm -hmm. moment. My friend who helps people, you know, get into the present moment, she does some mindful coaching. She says, you're going to ask yourself, what do you see? What do you hear? And what do you smell? Right. And answer those questions to pull you in if you need those prompts. Yeah, that will bring you right back to the present. And your children will bring you to the present too. They really they will. will. Because mm-hmm. they're always in the present. But once they get to about eight years old, seven and eight, that's when they start doing their, they can start accessing the higher centers to plan and reflect. But before then, they're very much in the present. And that's why it's like 10 minutes before dinner and they go, can we go to McDonald's and get some ice cream? You're like, what are you, crazy? (laughs) You know, and because they're in the moment feeling like McDonald's because they just saw a McDonald's bag or something somewhere or or the symbol or something. And they just think what they they want. Yeah, they're so pure and so present. And really all we have to do to get present with them is connect, like look in their sweet little eyes and they'll bring us right in. A lot of times my approach with this connection with them is to just look at them and in your brain, like with little infants and babies, you're going to, you're going to go, there you are. I see you because they want to be seen. But in your mind, if you're talking to a 12 year old, look at them and in your mind say, there you are. I see you. That's a way to get yourself really present with them. See them like you saw them as a newborn. You're not going to say there you are to a 12 year old, you know, right. or even a younger kid before the age of four and four, they're, they're going to like, they love it. Peekaboo. 
see me, see Mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Everyone just wants to be seen. That's so beautiful. I was in a classroom yesterday uh, in a, in a coaching in a school. And and usually when I'm come, I'm like the Pied Piper because I got my little apron. I've got all these little connection things. And when I see the kids, I'm connecting with them all the time. And when I go there, I can always tell, I can usually tell when a teacher's disconnected, but they're doing their program, but they're not quite connected because they're always thinking of the thing ahead. But I can always tell because when I, I, the kids come to me, I can see they're so seeking connection. They're just kind of cling to me. Can I do this? Can I do this? Will you do this? Will you do this? Will you do this? Can I do that? And, 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 and they're, they cling to me. So I go out to the playground and I've got five or six kids around me and I'm thinking, okay, this class needs more connection. They just, Mm -hmm. kids need more connection. Okay. Jenny, every single thing that we've talked about today, I think really boils down to the principles and the foundations of conscious discipline, which is such a beautiful thing. I'm so blessed to have had this brought into our family's lives. And what I really wanted to do in this episode is give people an insider look into you, beautiful you and your life, and literally how powerful these tools have become and can become in your life for any challenges you're going through. I encourage everybody who's watched this episode to go back and watch our first episode And then I'm also going to link any resources for Ginny. I'm going to link her book, run out and get it. It's phenomenal. Um, Some websites, some other things that people can learn more about you and some of the tools in in conscious discipline. And then what we're going to do now is we're going to film a bonus episode on one of your incredible tools to help bring a family together. So stay tuned. Uh, You guys can find the info below on how to take advantage of that episode. And we'll see you soon. Bye. And thanks so much. I wish you well. I hope you enjoyed that episode. She is such an incredible human being. You know, Jenny's life and the way that she has balanced all of the challenges that she's overcome is such a testament to the tools that are taught in Becky Bailey's system of conscious discipline. If you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and throw a like under it. Be sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you would, go ahead and send this on to someone you know in your life who needs this information. Jenny's content absolutely has the power to shift not only our lives, but the lives of our children and their children. Thank you.